every pilgrim gets a stone in their shoe eventually. You wake up one morning thinking, is this really all that there is to knowing the creator of 100 billion galaxies? And you read the book of Acts and you ask, why isn't it like that anymore? And your world falls apart and you desperately need a miracle in your life and you stare up at the stars and you feel things bigger than religious language. And you say to yourself, if this thing is true, there's got to be more power. There has to be more mystery, more actual personal experience. And so, finally, you turn to God, half wondering whether you're any more than half serious, and you say, Lord, teach me to pray. And he replies, I thought you would never ask. How is that for an opening paragraph of a book written on prayer? This one is uh, called How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. Just that title alone wins today. Because let's be real, have you ever just felt like prayer's complicated? Have you ever just felt like, I mean, I, I want to pray, but when I pray, I desperately desire to sound like Bishop Bob Hayes, but I'm, I'm more, like I'm more squeaky. I feel more Gomer Pyle, I know I'm dating myself, than, than anything else. Do you ever feel like, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Is there a format? Is there a rhythm? You just desperately, it's like you desire, you have this craving for more. But somehow we convince ourselves that we just will never get there because really praying, that's just for the clergy. That's just for the ministers. But is, it, is it possible, is it possible that this is a gift that's given to every single one of us? So this book really was an inspiration for us last year. We'll really, I'll take a picture, we'll post this. So if I don't reference this again, you're, you're not gonna miss it. It really was kind of the the heartbeat for where we wanna take you over this Lenten journey. Because what I love so much about this author, Pete Gregg, is he really wants to, to bring prayer um, to a place where, even if you feel like you can't do it, to, to, to give you some practices, to give you some rhythms on how you can enter into this beautiful gift that's been given to us. How many came to Ash Wednesday? Anyone, a few people came to Ash Wednesday. If you were here for Ash Wednesday, you actually went through this entire series that we're about to begin teaching on. Because what Pete does, he says there's these rhythms to prayer. So he uses the word pray, and he breaks prayer down this way. Pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Pause. The video that you just saw before I started reading. Remember when he takes the iPhone and he just slides it to off. Pause. A beautiful way to start prayer is just to center yourself. I'm gonna talk about what that looks like next week. Pause, rejoice. <laughs> rejoice is just to raise your hands, palm out. Rejoice is to just praise him because he is for us. He is not against us. Rejoice is not really to focus on everything that's wrong with the world, but just focus on everything that's right. And then ask. So many times in our prayer life, maybe we think that this is where we start. We start with the ask, but no. I think there's an element of centering ourselves, turning off the noise. There's an element of rejoicing that's necessary. But then, what is on your heart? What can you ask for? Are you just supposed to pray for everyone else? Is it okay to pray for yourself? I mean, you have these needs. Maybe they're small in relationship to the coronavirus that's like, I mean, doesn't God have enough stuff going on in the world? Can I even pray for myself? Can you even, what's the point? If God has a set will for my life, can you even change the mind of God? I can't wait to preach on asking in a couple weeks. But lastly, to yield, the last part of pray, yield, it's the most beautiful but sometimes the most difficult part because we end the prayer with this, palms up, 
hands in front of us and we say these words. This is so hard. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's where we're going to go. We just sense the Lord calling us to a season of prayer. And more than just seeing harvest, seeing this community engage in prayer for a season, what makes me so much more excited is not sort of boxing this into a season, but instead developing the habit of disciples, of believers who establish a rhythm of prayer, not for a season, but for a lifetime. So here's where I want to go today. I just want to set the table. Before you actually eat the meal, you got to put the plate, the empty plate, on the table. So I want to talk about today, why is prayer important? Why is prayer necessary? If you have your Bibles, I would love to encourage you, open your Bibles up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. Because there's this seemingly small, simple question that was asked of Jesus in Luke chapter 11 that actually led to what I believe are 13 verses that speak to the priority of prayer, according to Jesus, the persistence of prayer, how Jesus says, listen, be persistent in your prayer life, and when you make it a priority and you make it a persistent habit in your life, the promise that comes back to us when we engage in prayer. So Luke records this very well. Here's where we start, Luke chapter 11, verse one. Let me go straight into it. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Okay, context. Jesus is just praying. Some believe it was in a garden. We don't know where it was, but we know he was just practicing this rhythm of prayer. And as he is finished, he goes back to join his friends and a disciple, we don't know which one asked this question. I mean, in my mind, Simon Peter, you know, was always the just spurted stuff out. So I feel like this really has a hint of Simon Peter, but we know that a disciple said this, hey, Lord, would you teach us to pray? What an interesting question. Would you teach us to pray? To be a disciple is to be a learner. To be a disciple is to ask the questions. When you see things you don't understand, when there are things that are at work, to be a disciple is to be covered in the dust of our rabbi. So I love that it's, it's an important question to teach us to pray. Don't you think we would learn more as a people if we raised our hands and we asked questions? How many of you... Really, this is kind of funny when you think about it. Have been in some sort of a classroom teaching or you have been at a, a lunch and, and you've been sitting and someone's been talking and you have no idea what they're saying, but you find your head just doing this. Anyone? Am I the only person? And why? Because, I don't know, maybe pride gets in the way. Maybe we just seem like we're not smart enough if we go, I'm sorry, can, can you unpack that a little bit more? I, I tend to, there's times I just, I don't. I don't want to look like I'm not smart, case in point. I walk in my neighborhood a lot, and last fall, I was walking, and I realized I was wearing an OU, Oklahoma University shirt, as I was walking in my neighborhood. You're also apparently supposed to say boomer sooner when you say that. So uh, why was I wearing it? My daughter went to OU for a, a period of time. So I'm walking along, and there's this guy that was coming towards me in the trail, and he stopped me. He got right in front of me. He said, hey, that game yesterday? And his eyes got real big, and I went, yeah? And he goes, Joe Smith? I'm making up a name. I don't know, but he said a name, and I went, wow, right? Wasn't that incredible? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't, I don't know sports. I don't watch any sports. I don't know who he is. And then, and then it goes further. He goes, third quarter and 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 I go I mean when he ran and the whistle blew I was like wow we had an extended conversation about something that I had no idea what I was talking about and if by chance you're visiting harvest today super awkward I'm so sorry but praise the Lord as Jesus is praying as he's taught in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount he talks about prayer I love that there was just something that led one of the disciples to say, you've got to teach me how to do that and why. 
Because Jesus, listen, practiced prayer in his life. He practiced it. Jesus made it a priority. In fact, Luke records more of these moments of Jesus praying than any of the other gospel writers. Listen, see if you hear um, a pattern here. Luke 5, 15 and 16. Yet the news about him, Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But, verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Look over the next page, Luke chapter six, verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the entire night praying to God. A couple more chapters, Luke chapter nine, verse 28. About eight days after Jesus had said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him, and he went up onto a mountain to pray. Listen, this is important. And as he was praying, The appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Of course, Luke 11, Jesus was in a certain place, and he was praying. Luke chapter 22, verse 40, on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation, and he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down, and he prayed, Father, If you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He modeled prayer in his life. He made it a priority. So the disciples seeing that every time Jesus prayed, every time he dug in, not only did his face reflect the image of his father, but on the other side of these extended periods of making prayer a priority, there were healings that would happen immediately afterward. There was the ability to stand against the devil's temptations. There was the ability to walk on water. There was the ability after prayer to feed 5,000 people so the disciples see the power that's found in prayer and they say, we want what you have. So would you teach us? Such a small question, but it's so loaded. Do you know one more thing? The only time you find in the Gospels anyone asking Jesus for a specific teaching on a topic is right here in Luke 11, 1. Teach us to pray. How interesting that his friends didn't say, Lord, would you teach us to preach? (laughs) Would you teach us to prophesy? Would you teach us to cast out demons? Would you teach us how to grow a bigger church? No, they said, teach us to pray. Now, From this point, everything else Jesus is about to say, I'm gonna read the next 13 verses here in a moment. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture Jesus doing this. Because I believe Jesus gets so excited that his friends wanna know more about prayer. So Jesus opens with this, you ready? Verse two. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. (laughs) For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, in case your world is rocked, you're like, wait a minute, that prayer's missing some things. Jesus messed up. All right, the Lord's prayer's in two different places. It's in Matthew chapter six, calm down. Matthew chapter six, Jesus is talking about prayer. He says, when you pray, this is how you should pray. We have more of the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter six. Jesus gives an abbreviated, a shorter version, according to Luke in Luke chapter 11, which is right, are we doing it wrong? Here's my suggestion to you. Don't get caught up so much in the ritual of the Lord's Prayer, but instead in the rhythm of what Jesus is teaching. Honestly, we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's really not. 
It's the disciples' prayer. Jesus says, when you pray, just stop right there. When, not if. Not when you are backed into a corner and you have exhausted all other resources and then you decide to pray. Boy, that would be lengthy in the Lord's Prayer. But instead, it's when you pray, Father. Again, go back to pause. Father. He doesn't say master or king or teacher. Jesus goes straight to what is the most intimate word, Abba. Daddy, Father, start there. When you say the word Father, you're recognizing that you are sons and you're daughters of God. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible to think about. When I was, um, when, I was when my kids were younger, uh, I was in youth ministry, I was a youth director, and I traveled a lot over the summer, and I would go on all these different trips, and I remember I'd come home, and I'd walk in the door and I'd say, hey, Dad's home. And my kids at the time, Nick and Gabby, were little. Nick was always fearless, so I knew anytime I walked in the door, I had to prepare for this because I would hear Nick say, Dad! And he would run across the room, and he would never just come up and give me a hug. He would like, he would jump, he would leap. So I knew when I walked in the door, I didn't have to hold anything because I was just going to catch him. When he was around 13, and I'd walk in the door, and I'd hear, Dad. I'm like, don't jump on me. You're too old for this now. But when you come home, there's just something about your kids going, Daddy, let me tell you, any time, if you're worried about praying wrong, just to stand before God and say, Father, it delights the Father's heart. You're not doing it wrong when you just stand in his presence and you say, Father, pause. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. Praise. Hallowed. Holy. Hallowed. Sanctified. Hallowed. Set apart. Ask. Give us this day our daily bread. Yield. Lead us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yield, for thine is the king. Do you hear? There is a rhythm to the prayer. Jesus says when you pray, these elements that we're going to spend the next several weeks teaching through are so important when you establish these rhythms of prayer. Jesus made it a priority. When his friends say, teach us, he's saying to them, you make this a priority in your life. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, permission to be persistent in your prayer life, persistent. Here's what I mean. He tells them a parable. Verse five, Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and you say, hey friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside the house answers, <laughs> hey, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Again, Jesus, I believe, is laughing when he says this. And he says this, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, those two words have rocked my world. Say shameless audacity. Say it. Shameless audacity. That's it permission to be persistent. Jesus said, yet because of your shameless audacity, you know that joker will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So, all right, is Jesus saying that God, our heavenly father, is that angry next door neighbor who doesn't want to get out of bed and help us when we're in need. Quite the opposite, <laughs> quite the opposite. There was this Jewish tradition. Again, you have to read the scriptures through first century eyes. There was this Jewish tradition, this custom, that if you needed food in your house or you had guests and you didn't have enough food, it's incredible to think that you could just walk next door and ask your neighbor for food. Who does that? Is that even possible? Apparently it is. So if you would go next door and you would knock, the Jewish tradition was if there was someone who was in need, you would give them what you have. Why? Because if you refused, it would bring shame 
on your household, it would bring shame on your name. Why? Because when you read the Old Testament, I'm in Leviticus, I'm reading through Leviticus, and when you read the Old Testament, you find that God cares about those who are hungry. God cares. There was a, a gleaning of the fields, but there was a command from God, don't collect everything. Leave some leftovers so that those who are hungry and in need will actually come and will be able to eat if they're hungry. So Jesus is saying, even if you have to pound and pound and pound, you know, you know your next door neighbor is gonna give you what he wants because he's not gonna wanna bring shame onto his name. And if that's the case, how much more is your heavenly father who is for you, not against you, when you are persistent in your prayer life, it's not going to be a reluctance, but instead, how much more is it going to be a delight to respond to you when you're persistent in prayer? Warren Wearsby, a commentator that I read a lot, I love the way he unpacks scripture, he's very visual for me, and he said this about being persistent in prayer, I love the way he said this. Why does our Father in heaven answer prayer? Not, not just to meet the needs of his children, but to meet them in such a way that it brings glory to his name. When God's people pray, God's reputation is at stake. The way he takes care of his children, listen, is a witness to the world that he can be trusted. Remember, it gives him glory. Phillips Brooks said, that prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but it's laying hold of his highest willingness. Let me say that one more time. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but instead it's laying hold of his highest willingness for your life, persistence in prayer. It's not an attempt to change God's mind, but to get ourselves to the place where he can trust us with the answer. So Jesus actually says, shameless audacity when it comes to prayer, being persistent in your prayer life is more than okay. It's necessary when you go before your Father. And the promise that comes as a result? So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Anyone? Or if he asks for an egg, surprise, you give him a scorpion. No, if you then, though you are evil, now I'm like, whoa, Jesus, that's harsh. Here's what he means. If you then, though you are evil, meaning though you are flesh, you have humanity in you, there is brokenness, there is sin. If you then, even though you are sinful in nature, know how to give good gifts to your children. Here it is. How much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? <laughs> there is a, there's a promise that in every prayer we place before our Heavenly Father, that our Father is for us, that there is goodness that comes as a result of our prayer. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. There's a movement that's in that pattern. Have you ever thought about to ask? Well, that's using your voice. To seek in your prayer life, that's using your feet. That's a movement. But to knock is to use your fists. It is to plead and it's to pound on the door of heaven. And know this, it's not a magic, like God's not a genie in a lamp. We've talked about God is not Amazon Prime. There are things that I have asked for in my life in prayer, very earnestly and very honestly, that I look back right now, sometimes God will say no. But I'm telling you, I look back where I am at the ripe 
young age of 48 years of age, and I am so thankful God said no to so many things that I pounded on the heaven, the, the doors of heaven for, because I stand in a place now where I see that even in the no, his goodness was present in a way that I, I savor it now because I see where he has taken me on this journey. So my encouragement today is to just get started. Is it gonna be messy? It might be. But is it complicated? No. It delights the Father's heart when we come into prayer. Just one chapter later, Jesus is talking about birds. He's talking about people that are overwhelmed. And you've heard this. He says, look at the birds. Look at the lilies. Look at how God takes care of them. And are you not more than they? And I love in Luke 12, Jesus says these words. Verse 32. So do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's pleased. It's his delight when we come to him in prayer. So here's your challenge this week. I want you to pray from the heart. What does that look like? Great question. I'm glad you asked me. Anyone ever seen Bruce Almighty? Okay, here we go. I believe that Hollywood does actually a really good job of telling the redemptive story of God, the struggle of humanity, but how God is, is actually powerful and how there's restoration at work in the world. And, and it doesn't always take a Christian independent film to tell the story. I think secular Hollywood tells it well. Well, Bruce Almighty, now hear me. Your pastor's not saying, hey, pull the littles tonight. Let's get the family together, pop some popcorn. Pastor Mark said we're gonna watch Bruce Almighty. Eh, I'm not saying that. I do believe this two-minute clip is okay for everyone to watch, though, right? It has to do with prayer. Now, if you've seen it, Jim Carrey, he plays Bruce, and he gets this opportunity to be God because he thinks he can do it so much better, and towards the movie, spoiler alert, he does a terrible job of it. In fact, the one thing that he loves the most is a woman in his life by the name of Grace. And at this point, she's left him, she's done. And he realizes more than likely because of all of his choices, he's never gonna get her back. And, and this clip that I'm gonna show you, he had this, uh, Bruce had this prayer bracelet with him and he gave up, he was done because prayer doesn't work and he threw it. Now, you're about to see Morgan Freeman who plays the character God. My children are 24 and 21. I still think they think Morgan Freeman is God. I'm working them through that. But you're gonna see God come up to Bruce and he is about to give him his prayer bracelet back and he's gonna tell him to pray. 